Welcome to everyone who just joined. I'm so excited for this reverse coattails panel. Uh, as a matter of introduction, my name is Suzanne Wei, and I am the Western Regional Director for Run for Something. And um, yeah, excited to get started. So to start off, um, and I'll just kind of um, go around and folks can popcorn. Uh, as a matter of introduction, if uh, the panelists could just introduce themselves briefly. Uh, and I know we're only here for 40 minutes, so if folks could keep their um, remarks just to you know one or two minutes, that'd be great. And um, we'll start with Senator Hunt. Hi, everybody. How's it going? Thumbs up if you can hear me. Yes, OK. Um, I am Megan Hunt. I represent Omaha in the Nebraska legislature. I'm a state senator. Nebraska has the only one house legislature in the country, so we don't have any caucuses. We don't have any um, party leadership because we're also the only official nonpartisan legislature in the country. We're also the smallest with just 49 members. And so I'm really grateful to be a part of that body now. I'm just going into my sixth year. Um, and, uh, I popped in earlier and I heard some of the panels and some of the keynotes and I, you know, I'm no political genius. I, um, you know, in the era of term limits, I'm also not even that experienced, but I feel really grateful to be here today. And I hope that I can share some things that, that reach you guys. Thank you. Awesome. And now let's uh, go to school board member Santos. Thank you. It is such an honor to be here with incredible, hopefully future candidates, current candidates, and really with these incredible panelists. Um, I am the first ever formerly undocumented person to serve on the Miami-Dade School Board and the youngest ever elected. Um, and the Miami-Dade School Board is the third largest in the nation. We serve uh, about 350,000 students. Um, and being a young progressive in Florida on a school board right now is a really interesting thing to navigate. So I can't wait to chat a little bit more about that. Awesome. Um, and now what about uh, Clerk Gonzalez? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Amanda Gonzalez, and I'm the clerk and recorder in Jefferson County, Colorado, where I oversee elections for about 450,000 voters. We're just outside of Denver. And uh, I am also the first Latina and first out person in the role. Um, I not only oversee elections, but also uh, marriages, recording of title documents, and five motor vehicle offices. So it's kind of an interesting position. Excited to be here. Last but certainly not least, uh, what about school board member Edmond? My name is Caprice Edmond, and I'm on the school board in Pinellas County. And this is my third year. I had the opportunity to run two elections. I was elected during a special election and had to run again. So in um, our school board, uh, races are nonpartisan. And I look forward to continuing the discussion of elections and running for office. For sure. So we'll start off with um, a bit of a fun question. Uh, first off, congrats to all of you for winning your elections in some deeply critical districts um, and communities. But what was your favorite um, memorable moment on um, election night or in your campaigns? And uh, we, we'll uh, start with um, uh, school board member Santos. Sure, thank you. Um, I built out a student fellowship throughout my campaign to give some form of organization to volunteers, mostly students who were coming on to support me. And our student who led the communications team came to our election night party and said, this morning, my entire very conservative Haitian family, who has been, they had been citizens for a while, had never voted in this country and came out and voted for me, uh, all of them in droves. And so knowing that we were turning people into first time voters who saw past whatever, you know, the perceived values were assigned to a party was really wonderful. And anyone else uh, jump in, we're hoping to kind of have a controlled, uh, but you know, free flowing discussion. For me, it was during my second election watch night. <laughs> By that time, everything had become very you know, political and partisan, and that's not how I campaigned. I campaigned on values and 
um, advocating for educating all children. So when the results came through after feeling like I had to campaign for two years and seeing the results as a landslide, it was definitely reassuring that um, the community that I represented and the people who voted wanted a candidate that was truly focused on education and the children. Yeah, and what about you, Claire Gonzalez? Uh, I wonder if it's, you know, it was, you know, different for you, given your, your position of, um, you know, in, in elections. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I and I was up against an election denier, so it was really important to win this race. So, you know, election night felt great. I think that for a lot of us on this panel, uh, we know that systems were largely built not to include us, right? That, that women and young women and women of color and folks that are out are not necessarily supposed to be the folks that are are leading by design. And so being there just felt amazing. Um, I, I didn't necessarily, it wasn't something that I like knew I would win this race. And so um, I actually like started the night, not at the big election party, because in case I wasn't ahead, I, I wanted to put my face together first. Um, but I think another really cool part is when we were doing voter outreach calls um, and doing GOTV calls, our youngest volunteer was 13. I think Olivia was 13 at the time. And our oldest person making calls was 84. And so just sort of having that breath was was really, really cool. I'll share a quick anecdote. So I was not the party pick for the nominee my first time running. Um, no one asked me to run. I wasn't in the pipeline. No one was happy that I was doing this. And, you know, I my real job is I'm a shop girl. I run a independent, I ran an independent clothing boutique at the time. I just ran a little store in my neighborhood and now I own a stationary store and that's just kind of like my job and what I do. And so I didn't have any like political support from the system and I didn't have any really like political operatives helping me win. And it was just my, my friends who work with me at the store, literally like my team and my staff that supported my first campaign. And I was so nervous and on election night, I, it was an unbelievable feeling. We won by a landslide, like incredible split. And it kind of showed the party, like this kind of authenticity, you know, it's not that we have to make a candidate in a lab, you know, especially for these state and local races. Um, we've got to just sort of elect people whose hearts are in the right place and who are who are in the community, who are known by the people who are voting for them. And, you know, I just have the, the view that none of this is permanent. Like, this is an extremely temporary job. And I have the gift of representing these people at this moment. And I'm going to move on and do something else. But um, just that huge win, knowing that the party wasn't really behind me, you know, felt kind of good. <laughs> Yeah, and that's certainly a unique perspective, not being sort of that um, entrenched pick. Um, so going along that same vein um, of what, you know, Senator Hunt was talking about, how did you guys, you know, mobilize your communities? Because um, we're, you know, at Run for Something, we're a fan of, um, you know, to the topic, reverse coattails, um, which is basically the idea that increasing civic engagement and focusing on local races actually you know, encourages and increases voter turnout um, and, you know, more diverse progressive leaders. So how did you mobilize your communities, um, especially if they weren't, um, you know, the traditional partisan um, communities that people always think of? And we can, you know, start um, back with you, Senator Hein, because you mentioned, you know, mobilizing your friends. Sure. I mean, I, I never was a political I mean, I was a political person like normal people, like I vote and I pay attention to read the news and stuff, but I wasn't like a volunteer. I'd never worked on a campaign before. I thought the party sucked, like, you know, kind of universal opinion in my state and my city, actually. And I got really, I got in this world around like 2015, we were working on updating our sex education curriculum in our schools. And I know school board people here, you know, Louisa, 
you can imagine probably how that went in a conservative community. And it was a very, very tough battle. And long story short, we won. We did it. We updated the curriculum. And after that, we saw our STD and STI rates in my county like plummet. And we can attribute that to the fact that people were just getting better education about their health and their bodies. And I was a leader of that movement. And so I started to realize that people were seeing me not just as like a business leader or a community leader, but maybe as a political leader. And we just tried to meet people where they were. I know that's like a really buzzy phrase, but you really don't have to invent the wheel with campaigning. Like go on Facebook events, go on Instagram and see like what people are doing. Where are they? Um, what food do they like? What are people eating? Where are people going to hang out? Just go there and have events and get your friends to help you. I couldn't have done any of this without my friends. And, you know, not having any like political workers really on my side from the beginning. It was like very legally blonde vibes of just like my friend group really like getting behind me and making posters, helping me with a website, like hosting a tea party, hosting a donut fundraising drive, like all of these things and my friends from the business community as well. And so, you know, this is my experience, but I'm saying you don't have to make every event like a political event. Like don't act like a politician. It's fake. Like, cause you're not one, especially if you're at like the state and local level, like maybe you get there someday because the system messes you up and the institution makes you that way. But like, just be regular, just go to the stuff normal people are going to, tell them what you're doing, talk to them. Um, and if people offer to help you, like say, what, what do you think you could do? Like, what kind of event would you wanna to go to? What are you doing this weekend? Can I come? Can we talk to voters? Um, and just let it be organic. And I know folks are, uh, you know, jumping into the chat um, here. Uh, and so, you know, anyone else want to kind of jump in? Uh, school board member Santos, like, you know, you, seems like you guys had a, a great story there. Absolutely. As Megan just said, definitely finding unique ways to engage. We, I have a friend who's a yoga teacher, so we did a yoga Zoom. Uh, we also, I have a friend who's a, a poet and writes like uh, on. Uh, Oh my gosh, I'm blinking on, um, gosh, the typewriters. He writes uh, poems, custom poems, like short ones for people. Um, and so just finding the people who were already in my circle and bringing their unique talents to engaging new people um, was key. And those events or initiatives weren't successful because they brought in like thousands of more people, but it certainly sent people a message about, like Megan was just saying, this girl's not just a politician out here. She's like cares. She's a real person, wants to do good, you know, well by our community. Um, I also, I mentioned the student fellowship earlier. This was key for me because I did feel like for the size volunteer group that I needed, it was hard to constantly week by week be making new asks and managing people. And so even though it was loosely organized, having a structure that people could plug into um, and sign up for a team to know that every week they were going to be doing a certain job. And some people had like one hour a week jobs and some people really got on board. They're retirees and they worked like full time jobs uh, as volunteers in the campaign. Uh, but everyone sort of belonged to a team that had a check in structure and that really helped a lot. Um, the last thing I'll say about effective mobilizing is, um, you know, once I convinced a consultant to work with me because I was definitely not the chosen candidate, they would tell me, OK, here's the way we're going to do things. And none of it made sense to me. So the example I'll give concretely is text messaging. They would say, okay, here are the type of text messages that we need to send out. And I said, well, these sound so overused. And what we ended up doing was saying, okay, we're gonna do text messages, but we had at the end of the day, like 15 different target groups where we grouped people by age, by race, by party, by zip code. And so every message was tailored ever so slightly, maybe the emoji changed through the age group. Um, but it was so targeted that people actually were more likely to open and engage. Uh, and then we always have people ready to, you know, answer back. And that targeted messaging, as opposed to like, one message for everyone was vital to our success. Awesome tactic. That's smart. What I got one thing. What about those emails where they're like, 
Megan, we need one more donor from your zip code or we will lose. It's like, shut up. That's so stupid. Okay, I'll leave it to you, Amanda. <laughs> I mean, I also totally agree. Like, don't send me three paragraph long text messages. I, I, I don't even read text messages for my friends. Like, uh, why are you sending me this? <laughs> yeah, I so I had people who, I had volunteers who, you know, are now close friends that were like, collecting petition signatures for me. I also um, was not initially the institutional pick. Um, my background is in nonpartisan work and the party, um, you know, was much more familiar with other candidates. Um, and, you know, I've knocked doors for other people, but I definitely had not stood in parking lots for people I did not know asking other people to sign petitions. And so I was just really moved by their generosity and commitment. Um, I think it's, uh, and not sure, sorry, it talks about, uh, you know, preaching to the choir and you're often told like, oh, don't preach to the choir. Those people are already with you. But like, if you've ever heard a choir, uh, often a hot mess, right? I don't know if y'all have been to your kids' choirs, uh, but you know, there's so much value in working with and further developing the people that you know are already with you, are excited about you, uh, because they're just gonna magnify that work that you're doing. You can't be all of the places at once. Um, I had a volunteer who, he and his wife baked 400 lemon bars for me and then hand delivered them to delegates' homes. I mean, people were delivering lemon bars at like two in the morning. Um, it was, it was so moving, but the number of text messages that I got or emails that I got about lemon bars and people saying, oh my gosh, you're clearly working for this, um, was, was amazing. Yeah, that's awesome. And I, you know, hear from all of you, it's important to personalize the message. Like, yes, there is a huge cause, but people want to hear from you and want your authentic, uh, you know, selves and, and, you know, that comes across even in like authentic communication. So I think that. That's super important. Um, and so, you know, um, uh, Clerk uh, Gonzalez, you've um, taken on the role of increasing local voters, um, but, you know, the, the number of local voters, but also making it safe and inclusive. So do you have any advice for anyone who's running for that, you know, specific clerk position um, or recorder position in their communities? Yeah. So, um I had previously run a voting rights nonprofit and I used to run the state's largest nonpartisan election protection effort. And so I was really running because elections are really important to me. It is the way that you make your voice heard. And you know whether you agree with me personally or not, that's okay. What we need to have is a fair system that everybody can trust. And that was why I was running. And so I would say to folks, know your why, know why that's important to you and be able to communicate it. I think that very few people know what a clerk is. Um, I'm also a licensed attorney and even my friends who are attorneys and statistically have far more um, educational attainment than the average Coloradan were saying like, you wanna be a clerk, but you're an attorney, like like a clerk at a court. Right? And I was like, nope. This is the person who's in charge of your elections and marriage licenses. And so ha being able to explain that to people quickly about how important these local uh, positions are, even if they're not top of mind the way, you know, a presidential race is, I think was really important. Um, and finally, I think to that end, I also kind of had some of those examples of like, y'all remember that like really terrible woman with the horrible hair in Kentucky that was like denying people's uh, marriage licenses? You know, that was that was a clerk. Um, and these roles are really important. They are the people that decide where drop boxes go, who feels welcome in government, who feels included, who's invited. And so um, I think communicating that was just really important in this race. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, that especially for local races, that education component is a huge part um, of, you know, your your messaging. Um, so, you know, going to, um, you know, school board member Santos, um, you've had the unfortunate experience of, you know, being actually targeted uh, by your own governor and getting that sort of publicity that's not super welcome initially, but how have you used um, that media attention to highlight and endorse your own values? Yeah, um, so waking up one day to, you know, 
from a family that immigrated to this country and takes pride in the freedom that exists, waking up on a target list by a governor was definitely not what we expected when we built our lives here. Um, but in that moment, you have a choice, right? Uh, I could, uh, you know, let that take me down or I could think about how to use it to my advantage, which is just exactly what I did. I took every media interview I could with a very clear, concise, and pointed message that I work for students, all students, uh, and that that is the only thing that I will focus on. So I didn't want to allow that distraction to take me away from the work that I ran to do. Um, and I didn't want to allow any politician to win by letting by making me now be in the defensive or explaining what woke means or why I'm too woke. Um, rather, I used it as an opportunity to get on much bigger platforms very quickly and say, I am here to represent all students. And if you care about that, regardless of your party, you should be um, supporting me. And then I used it to raise a lot of money. I made a ton of phone calls and, you know, we're at 130,000 in two months because of it. So thank you to my governor. <laughs> That, well, that is crazy, <laughs> especially if you you're able to channel it into that that much money. And it you know it also you know is a way to fortify y your own um, message and make you stronger um, for that reelection. Um, so yeah, for Senator Hunt, um, you know you've also been no stranger to sort of the highly publicized controversy um, in your state. So you know how do you remain positive and engaged with? constituents in the midst of a lot of a lot of this. well first let's be real about one thing i'm not positive like <laughs> i'm i'm really struggling with this work lately you guys like i don't like it Great. i i'm not having fun and um you know i there's something unique about being in nebraska with like the unique type of legislature that we have um that is a little bit idyllic that I know that a lot of my colleagues in other states don't relate to or understand. Um, but it's hard remembering a time when, you know, having been there in a time when our legislature was so collegial, so friendly. I had all kinds of conservative friends who, so let me tell you backstory for these people. So my son is trans. I'm a single mom. My son is 13. He came out a couple years ago during the pandemic. Um, no problem. I found out I have a son. Great news. Um, love my kid. And that's it, right? Like, there's no fucking information from my colleagues besides that. But, you know, predictably with all the culture war stuff that we have going on, um, it was made a big, a big focus of this session. And we passed a ban on trans health care for youth in Nebraska. Um, in the last round of debate, they also wedged an abortion ban in there too. So it's like really painful and we're, we're um, litigating that in the courts right now. But um, it's hard because like my colleagues, I know them, they know me, they babysat my kid before, we've gone on trips before, we've been to their houses before, we've gone to their little old farms before. It's like, how can you do something so hateful to someone that you know? And that's, kind of what makes um, this time in politics so difficult. What I will say about positivity is there is nothing any lawmaker can do. There's no hate or shade or little comment that any voter or constituent can make that's more important than the work that we're doing. You know, all of these people, all of these politicians, wherever you live, they're all temporary. They're not gonna be there forever. Yes, their policies will impact us for a long time potentially, but these people are not kings and queens. They, you know, uh -oh, did we lose books? Oh, whoops. Oh Sorry, no. Sorry guys. Sorry guys, <laughs> I keep it's good. Back. Yeah, no, but uh, you know, can, please continue like, um, um, <laughs> I'll wrap up because I know we don't have a lot of time. Can you guys hear me okay, though? Yes. Is it echoing or something? Okay. Um, I uh, I just have to keep perspective. And that, you know, it's that, that Jewish proverb of you don't have to complete the work, but you can't abandon the work. 
And it's knowing that I'm standing on the shoulders of generations of people who have worked for justice, who have worked for freedom and equality. I'm learning from them. I'm part of that legacy too, but I'm not under any, um, you know, idea that I'm going to be the one to fix it. I'm part of a group that's working for something more and better. And that's just the perspective that I try to keep in the hard days. Um, that the work matters more than my feelings. The work matters more than, you know, my day-to-day -day ups and downs. And the way we're able to support each other in community um, through mutual aid, through things that government can't do, uh, that's an opportunity that I have as a leader to lift up as well. It's not just voting and making laws. It's the mutual aid and the community support that I can help foster as well. I just wanted to thank Senator Grant Hunt for that. Um, yeah. so I think that's really real that oftentimes when you're the first or you weren't the institutional pick or you look a little bit different from the people who governed before you, it's really lonely. Um, and, and that makes some of the work really hard. Um, and I think particularly in your situation where you had people making decisions on something that was really personal to you and your family and, and you really understood how important it was. Um, I think it's what probably makes you an excellent leader. Um, and also it's worth knowing that if you're considering running, um, pieces of, of running and pieces of governing are, are hard and sometimes lonely. And that's okay. We do it anyway. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. Do it anyway. I, you know, I'll be here for a, a long time and I won't always be a lawmaker. So I can't make this like my whole life and identity and, um, none of us should. Um, hopefully folks can hear me. I know I dropped off um, for a little bit, but thank you so much for, you know, sharing um, your perspective, uh, Senator Hunt, and, you know, super inspiring words. And, you know, and it's okay to admit that you're not positive, um, especially with a lot of um, the, st the stuff that folks are dealing with in, in, in states and feeling, um, you know, and not, not feeling safe. Um, so, yeah, I mean, um, you know, in, talking to you guys, you know, the education component um, is, is something that really matters in, in these local elections, especially because the constituents that you're um, serving might not um, be aware of what the position entails. So do you have any advice for folks who, um, for that education component, um, you know, whether it's the importance of those local offices and their overall impact um, in, in their communities? So any advice? And anyone can can start. <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Um, I would encourage everyone to invite maybe just one to three people to start off with to join you at a local school board meeting or to come watch an assembly in session or to come uh, see your county commission. Uh, because just actually one of the ways that I became interested in running was I came to a school board meeting and I couldn't believe how few times students had been mentioned. Um, and that actually made me curious enough to begin to understand the complexities of committees and how everything worked. So getting people to just join you, even if it's for an hour to come see your government in action is so eye-opening. Um, and then of course, you know, if it makes sense using social media to capture little snippets of oh did you know did you know that your school board actually um decides what kind of bathrooms are going to exist in your school building you know just sharing little things like that can be really eye-opening for people and be the thing that catches them into like wanting to learn more Yeah, I talked about some of the concrete examples that I was giving when I was running for office. Um, one of the things that I'm doing now that I'm in office is we are creating a citizen advisory or a, sorry, a resident advisory group. Uh, you don't need to be a citizen to be part of it. Uh, and part of that is that we want to have a better two-way channel of communication. I want to better understand what's impacting communities and have people understand what this office actually does, the way that they can have a say, even if they're not the elected official, um, and hopefully pass that information on to their neighbors and friends so that you know my office can do a better job and be more responsive and also have people in the community understand uh, what the office does and, and how important it is. 
I have, this is like kind of a, a, maybe a frivolous answer, but I feel like I have made such an impact through social media, honestly, like it's kind of like 10 years ago to say that, but um, I've had so many people reach out to me through like Twitter or Instagram and say like, I never knew about this or that. I never knew how our legislature worked. I never watched the legislature. I never thought to testify in front of my city council or school board until I saw you do it or until I saw you tell me how to do it or talk about it or share the work of this person who's doing it. And, um, you know, I, I do think that that's important and that is meeting people where they are. I mean, this is what people do all day. They, they do this on their phone. And so, um, I, I feel like as a, as a younger person, I have a knack for that as a digital native, but having people on your team who can help make content, who can help think of topics to kind of like unpack and make like a little Canva, you know, how to about something, uh, these things get shared a lot and this can help increase your platform to keep reaching more people. So it's like a very basic answer, but I, I do think it's a serious one. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, um, I heard a couple things there, basically, you know, being able to leverage your current office, you know, um, as incumbents and in, in keeping people engaged with that platform, um, and also figuring out the platforms where people are. Um, so that's, uh, you know, increasingly, they're just, it seems like more and more digital platforms and figuring out where um, the important, um, you know, the important messages and how to get them to, to folks. Um, yeah, so thank you, thank you all for that. Um, and so, last, you know, formal question, and then we can kind of, um, you know, hopefully, if there's a little time, <laughs> go to uh, some of the questions here. Um, but how would you, you know, suggest recruiting more progressives to run for the offices that you're in, the state and local offices? I think that we have to stop asking the party to lead that work. Um, there are groups of people who naturally organize, who naturally want to host, who want to get people involved, and they might not be part of a formal institution. They may not be part of the party. And, um, you know, I think we need more party leadership. I'm, I'm a registered independent. I'm no longer part of the Democratic Party. I left this year um, because I was really frustrated with the National Party fundraising off of our work in Nebraska when they have never given us a penny. We have never gotten a one dollar or one cent from the DLCC or from Emily's List or from any of these national organizations that are crowing about the good work progressive women are doing. Like, you know, you're not talking about me because you've never given me a dime and I could really use it. So. Um, we have a, a lot of people in Nebraska and Omaha and my community who are organizing without the party. And these people are such powerful leaders because they weren't asked to lead. Um, you know, when you don't need power, when you're not afraid to lose, that's when you have the most power. And that's something I feel like the party's never really grasped. So just get outside of the institution to find that next generation of leadership. Uh, there was a question in the chat that spoke to balancing working full time while uh, running for office. And I think those kinds of barriers are real. I worked full time while I ran for office um, and actually took a pay cut to take the job. And so looking at those sorts of practical matters, especially if you're somebody that's not from institutional wealth or somebody who has a lot of family members who have been elected to positions in the past, I think that those can be really, really scary. And some of the things that were most helpful for me were other local electeds, usually folks of color, who were like, let me give you practical stuff. Pay for this app. Don't pay for that one. Here's how you can organize a list. Here's how you can find a list. Here are um, affordable online resources for folks who are running for local office. Because I was from a nonpartisan background, um, I did not take any of the kind of traditional classes about how to run for office. And so um, balancing all of that was really hard. I also um, love connecting with people, but I am an introvert. And so working a full day and then doing campaign events at night um, was exhausting. 
And I, I will tell you that there were multiple Sundays that I woke up and I'd done three events on a Saturday and I was feeling really behind and, and I would kind of wake up in tears because it was overwhelming. And so I think offering that support and making sure that progressive candidates know that they aren't alone, um, that they are here, that there are people who are here to help. And then to the extent that either you are somebody that's run for office before, somebody who's been elected before, somebody that's helped on campaigns before, even just knowing those practical pieces Pieces, I think helps build people's confidence, makes them feel less alone, and makes the idea feel less overwhelming. I can uh, school board member Santos, anything to add to, to that? Um, or, you know, the question about balancing uh, working full time or work with, um, with the, the campaigning? Um, yeah, I know that's a huge challenge. Uh, I personally, I'm an entrepreneur. I was able to shift things around. So I'm, I'm not going to speak to that question because I think others have much more um, firsthand experience. But on recruiting more progressive candidates uh, to run for local office or office in general, um, I think you just have to ask. Uh, I was very, um, and ask many times, right? Um, and I've been, one thing I realized quickly is, until the makeup of my board changes, a lot of things that I want to see be different won't. And so I made it my business um, over the last three years to engage and um, kind of bring along through different steps of the process. Many people that are entrepreneurs that are, uh, you know, former teachers, the people who otherwise wouldn't think of themselves as being eligible candidates for office um, and I'm really proud that one of them like took me up on it and is is doing really well uh, in her bid for one of of to be a colleague of mine. Thank you all for sharing um, your experiences. And uh, we have a couple, a few more minutes. Um, and so I guess if does anyone have um, you know any sort of last words? Um, and we can kind of go around the horn there, but, um, you know, feel free. is there anything that you want to talk about with, um, or, you know, uh, comments that you want to make to the audience that you have currently um, of, you know, activists, um, what have you, um, about the work that you do, any advice for the future? I would just say be brave. Ask yourself what you are willing to do. You know, what can you do that you haven't been willing to do yet? Remember, it's a marathon. I don't have anything smart to say. Like, it's all the stuff you guys know. It's all the stuff you see on the little quotes on Instagram and everything. Like, all that. <laughs> but, you know, this is just your one little life. And if, you know, what more can you do that you haven't done? Try it. Try whatever you can. If any of you have any specific questions for me or want to chat more, I'm Nebraska Megan on everything, and I'm pretty responsive. So please keep in touch and consider me an ally for the work that you're doing. And um, if you run for something, if you're working on a project, please let me help you. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, other Instagram codes that I love to use, uh, get comfortable with being uncomfortable. We tell all our students that, like, just just lean in, just learn. Uh, and the other one, actually, a student brought to our office, and we use it, um, is sapere aude, which is Latin for dare to know. And so we're always like, we need to just dare to know. Sapere aude this one and ask questions that make me, you know, make us uncomfortable, put us in uncomfortable places. Um, and then... I will add one more piece, uh, which is like, be extremely strategic and stay focused on the things that bring tangible change. Don't get caught in, don't get caught up in the distractions and, and the, the symbolic things. Really try to stay focused, whether it's in your organizing or in running for office or in serving in office, on the things that will bring tangible change to your community in the context that you're in right now. I think I, for longer than I want to admit, uh, walked around in the world sort of believing that there was this rule book somewhere and that all these other people had access to it. And I was just messing it up left and right and looking like an idiot. And I didn't even know. 
and right, like that was so embarrassing to think about. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm not doing this right. And, um, and really it doesn't exist. And to the extent that it does, it wasn't written for you anyway. And so like, you're fine, do the things, contribute where you have the skills to contribute, whether that's running for office, whether that's helping on a campaign, whether that's helping teach your neighbor or the person that your kid goes to school with how to testify at school board meetings or in the legislature, like all of that matters. Um, and we need a really diverse group of people doing it. And so if you are ever that person that, has in your mind like oh gosh i'm messing it up because i just don't know how to do this thing correctly or there's this rule book don't believe it we need you all right that's um that's awesome advice and thank you to all of the panelists um and it looks like we ended uh you know pretty on time ish uh so you know follow these folks on social media um you know they are doing such important work in their communities and yeah you know thank you all for joining and we'll catch you on the the other sessions. Thank you all.